everyone, and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host, Yvonne Heath, author of the book, Love Your Life to Death, and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So I am trying to just contain my excitement a little, just because I, I don't want to be too really loud, but I am truly so excited and delighted and honored to be joined today by Ken Ross, one of my heroes, that's Ken over there, one of my heroes um, in all of my work in my 27 years of nursing was, of course, anyone who, who is in healthcare knows and loves the work of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was the pioneer of having conversations um, about grief, death, dying, and, and shared her conversations with dying patients to enlighten the rest of us to do death better. <laughs> and, um, and her work has touched millions and millions of lives. And Ken is her son, her son. <laughs> I'm just, I have to say, oh my goodness, I really met and I'm speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's son. So Ken, thank you so much for so graciously being here today, being so accessible. I love it. I, I thought, I am calling. I am sending this man a message. I'm sure I'll never Please. hear from him. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, sure, give me a call. And I, I just had to sit for a moment. So welcome. And how are you doing today? I am good. I'm enjoying life as my mom taught me and uh, just realizing that everything in life is chapters. So, you know, it's a tough time, but you got to find, you know, the glass half full and, and the happiness of wherever you are, whatever your situation is. So, you know, I'm enjoying my time at home. I'm getting to read books. I'm spending time with uh, my cats and <laughs> just, you know, enjoying the little things and not, you know, sweating that we're in a tough chapter because it is a chapter and there'll be another one coming along. So just, you know, find the grace and happiness wherever you are and, and any little thing, any little moment. So yeah. I so love that and and so much of what I share and and obviously you will agree is that grief and joy can coexist right so whatever struggles are going on we can still create joy yeah it's swirling waters of you know different waters swirling together and it's Ooh. all water it's part of life but yes. uh, you know it's confusing cuz it is swirling and mixing in waves and you know you don't know which way the waves are coming from but you know, that's life, you know, embrace it. I love that. And I love that. I, I'm sure you, you were alongside your mom for, with her journey around the world. I would love to hear, I, I want to hear the whole story, but you know, I, I could probably, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but exactly <laughs> a reader's digest version. Tell us about your journey with your mom and, and you're around the world and the message she brought and how it affected your life. Now, how many hours do we have? <laughs> I know. But, yes. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a complicated story because, you know, here I am as a young child, eight, nine years old. My mom is mostly a regular mom. She's a little eclectic, but, um, you know, and then she wrote this book on death and dying, which I just happen to have a copy of right here. <laughs> mm. And, um, you know, everything changed for the family and for my mom and, and for all of us because she was off giving lectures and workshops around the world and her lecture calendar went out two, three years. So the only way I got to see her sometimes was to go on trips. So I just go and our family was pretty easy going. So basically I could go anywhere in the world she was lecturing at any time. I could take time off of school. We could go spend the entire summer traveling with her you know, I traveled with her to about 20 countries on six continents, and we spent New Year's in Egypt, and we spent, you know, Eastern Australia, and the summer in Japan, and, uh, you know, it was it was pretty crazy. It was like this wild adventure that was kind of surreal, and my mother loved indigenous people, so we're constantly meeting, you know, faith healers, uh, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of people, you uh, People from tribes, you know, uh, witch doctors, fortune tellers, people who made tables float, you name it, you know, as well as meeting dying people who are not just older people, but people my age. And so mm -hmm. it was a very eclectic, unusual upbringing. And my father was a neuropathologist, so he was bringing home human brains 
a couple times a week and leaving them in the kitchen so I wouldn't forget them the next day because that's the door led out to the garage from the kitchen. So uh -huh. all the brains had to be in the kitchen. So uh -huh. we're eating dinner. My parents are arguing about life after death. We've got human brains sitting there. There's a dying person coming to see us after dinner. Oh, you know, then I'm, we're off to you know Brazil the next day. And it was, it was, you know, that was my normal, but I guess it's hard to like see it in the context of that's not everyone's normal. So, but to me, that was normal. <laughs> that is, it's so extraordinary. And I love that she had the, the vision to say, yes, come and travel. I mean, mm -hmm. or stay in school. I mean, how much more would you learn going to these countries, experiencing these different cultures? I mean, how incredible. Yeah, how and incredible. She, you know, she just reminded me and she didn't like push it in my face, but she was subtly, constantly reminding me that, you know, hey, you know, I mean, you're young, but life is short and it is precarious to some. So we should enjoy each day and live our lives love-based, not fear-based. And death is just something to not fear. We will respect it mm -hmm. and appreciate it, but, you know, use it as a teaching tool that, you know, go out and live a full life and challenge our fears and be a little crazy and a little eclectic. And, you know, so I, of course, became an artist, a photographer. Yes. And even though I had no training, but you know, I managed to do it and travel all around the world. So your photography, I've looked at your website and I would encourage anyone to go to your website is just so, I don't even know the word, it's exquisite. Like the, the colors, the expressions, everything you captured, I, I was literally in awe. I mean, it, you Thank have you. the very cool picture of Reese Witherspoon, but then you right. have, right? Like then you have India and these beautiful colors and you just, you captured people. It's like you captured their soul. It's extraordinary. Right. What, so, what it, so that's a reflection of what my mother taught me is that I see the world as a colorful, graphic, mm. amazing, surreal place. And that's totally reflected in my photography because, you know, uh, I think life is kind of surreal. I mean, the whole concept that <laughs> we're born in this body that, you know, someday will wear out and everyone we know is going to die. And the whole thing, if you think about it, it's kind of like surreal. Like, wow, this is like, how does this make sense? Like, how right. did life become this way? You know, and it's so complicated now. And we can get this metal tube and be anywhere in the world in 24 hours. And, you know, and yet people are all still so angry and, you know, think, you know, poor me. And uh, I'm like, do you know how much we have? Like, you know, we should be so grateful that we live in a time when there's all these medications and we don't live in the dark ages and, I could pick up the you know I could pick up this phone and I could talk to any person on the planet, you know, or I can see my friends in in Asia and South America. Or Canada, you know, it's a gift, right? Or Canada. <laughs> so you know, I'm just very appreciative of the time of history I'm living in and all these things. And yes, life is complicated and there's challenges, but wow, I mean that we have so much. I think people just get jaded and they don't appreciate. You know, I have like the entire knowledge of humanity on my computer in front of me i can see any book ever written mm -hmm. in seconds yeah I mean, that's like a miracle right so i always imagine myself like wow i'm so lucky to have been born at this time of history when we have so much like let's be appreciative of all the wealth we have of knowledge and culture and and spirit and everything like you know and people just don't appreciate it anymore well, and I think that these conversations, honestly, and, and having conversations about grief, death, and dying and, and bring, shedding light on it, if you've worked in this or it's been a part of your life, you have a different appreciation. I mean, I, my work, with it, 27 years of nursing certainly pales in comparison to your mother's work, but I was at the bedside of more dying people than I can count, and many of them were younger than me. And so you mm -hmm. have seen people die who were younger than you, and I'm sure in your travels, you've, you've seen extreme poverty. Oh, yeah. And, and often these are the most generous, loving people, yes. the people I meet on the street in Zimbabwe, invite me into their mud hut and share their meals with me. They have no money and right. barely any food and they're willing to share it with a stranger just walking down the street. You know, I, I see that hundreds and hundreds of times when some of these people are so generous and, you know, you find that technology and, and wealth kind of contaminates people sometimes, you know, uh, absolutely. Like, and and, and I think, values. yeah, it's, it's like a double-edged sword. It's such a gift to be able to connect Mm -hmm. Right, globally, and also it can rob us of our joy. And I feel like with people have 
often run from these conversations on grief, death, and dying in the pandemic has kind of made us pause and have to have these conversations. And I just wanted to go back and ask, so your mom wrote the book on death and dying. And I mean, it, it like changed the world. What did, was she a doctor before that for many, many years in different fields? Like what drew her to the study of death and dying? Well, I think my entire mom's life was kind of always came back to death. I mean, you know, she saw it as a child. She almost died. And then some of her friends died who were, you know, just a few, six, seven years, eight years old. Um, and then one of her neighbors died and she got to go say goodbye to him. And then as a teenage girl, she worked at a hospital. And so it was Switzerland. So she was only about 27 miles from the German border. So she was seeing people come in who had escaped across the river who had just, you know, had lost limbs and family members. And she heard stories every day. She heard dozens of stories about death and loss and grief. And then, you know, when uh, the war ended the next day, she was hitchhiking through Europe and starting to rebuild Europe as a teenage girl, right? So she spent two years going around Europe through peace groups, rebuilding villages, trying to heal people and helping people die because, you know, there was almost no medications, you know, and this is back in the forties. Mm -hmm. So she spent two years with dying people, you know, as a teenage girl, you know, and then she went to medical school, which, you know, very rare for Swiss women that age to, you know, in the fifties to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. She met my father, became a psychiatrist, moved to America and was disgusted to see the way people died in America compared to Swiss rural life where, you know, it was a very peaceful, loving event. People died at home. It was a part of the family, a part of the culture, part of the village life. And in America, you know, it was this death denying society where technology was somehow going to miraculously save us when it does not. And so that kind of false promise really messed up people's uh, aspect and view of what death is supposed to be like. Mm. Oh my goodness. It, it just, what saddens me is here I wrote my book and it, which came out in 2015 and I'm still addressing the same thing. <laughs> well, yeah, this book is, is oh, now yeah, 51 years old and, you know, we're still having the same conversations. We are. And I, I feel mm. in so many, of course, I mean, we have palliative care, we have the hospice movement and, you know, you and I spoke at the same conference, which is how we first connected a beautiful or the beautiful dying expo, which mm -hmm. was extraordinary. And, and we do have great organizations being a voice for change and we still have a long way to go. <laughs> we still have a long way to go. <clears throat> Um, yeah, and other countries too. I mean, they don't have hospice, they don't have palliative care, they don't, you know, they don't have anything. Like, it's just crazy. Like, you know, it's just, just America, it's like the whole world is suffering and dying horribly. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it's inhumane how people die in the 21st century. It is. And, <laughs> and so, as as much as that gives me tremendous grief and we can grieve mm -hmm. that, then we say, now what? And you are being a voice for change and I am being a voice mm -hmm. for change. And I have to, I will giggle a little bit because I know, so two things, first of all, when I, I was going to speak and then I heard, oh my gosh, Ken Ross is going to be speaking. And while well, I'm kind of talking about the stages and how that's not really, you know, it, and I can't be disrespectful to his mom. What if he's upset? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't offend Ken Ross. And I was p pacing in my house. And I mean, that was hilarious, that story. And then when you talked about um, the last decade of your mother's life, which I'd love you to share, and then you were going to get back to your life. Right. And I think life had other plans. The, the oh, universe, yeah. I think, had a little chuckle <laughs> at you, Ken, because life had other plans for you, didn't it? <laughs> yes, it did. So... You know, you, uh, my father taught me that's the role of the changes. Everything is chapters and, you know, the people who best get through life are the ones who are prepared to change plans like on the fly. Yes. And, you know, that's what I did. I took care of my dad when he was dying. I moved here from Manhattan. I was living on Madison Avenue and I moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, which was quite a cultural shift. <laughs> and wow. he died within six weeks of me getting here. And then I decided, well, you know, I've already put stuff in storage. I'm going to hang out for a year or two. And then, you know, the story about my mom's house being burnt down when she was building the AIDS hospice for babies. 
So tell that story, Ken, because I, I know people don't know that story. Well, oh, the story you might not know also is that this is the second time my mother's house has burned down. So like <laughs> the maddening crowds, like does that strike a bell with any <laughs> situation going on now? So, so, you know, the second time my mom was trying to start a hospice for AIDS babies, uh, when my mom was just about, I think, five or six years old, she had felt like she had been abandoned at a hospital because she had pneumonia and she was isolated. And so it really struck a chord with my mother that these AIDS babies were being abandoned by their parents who were just freaked out and didn't know what to do with them. And they just left them at hospitals. And my mom was horrified that a baby who had you know, one, two, three years to live, should have no compassion and human love and touch. So when she was lecturing, at every lecture, she would ask people to adopt these babies. And she had a lot of success. I mean, she got hundreds of babies adopted who were dying, which is amazing in itself, but it wasn't enough because my mother could never stop. I mean, she was just, you know, like, go, go, go. So she decided you know, she had to do more. And so she was going to build an AIDS hospice on her farm in rural Virginia. And the locals didn't like that. They said she's going to contaminate their groundwater and kill them all. And so my mother said, hey, you know, I'm doing the right thing. And if you don't like it, <laughs> tough. And so she got death threats. People shot bullets through windows. And, you know, she wouldn't back down. And so eventually they burnt down her house when she was away for a lecture. And same day, uh, her favorite llama was shot in the head, and the police ruled it an accident. Oh, my gosh. So then the next day, my mom had a TIA, a small stroke. So I knew I just had to get her out there because I'm still hearing bullets being shot near the farm, and I thought for sure they're going to kill her. So I kind of, we'll say, tricked her into coming down to Arizona for a vacation, and she never went back. But then I ended up being her caregiver uh, for nine years, which I hadn't thought about. And she had a staff of 13, 16 people, and then it was me. Nice. So she had a very complex life, even though she was a kind of a simple woman in some ways, a Swiss hillbilly. Mm. She, you know, had a huge staff of people. She had, you know, uh, 86 publishers around the world. She had, you know, dealing with the press, dealing with people showing up from around the world, permissions, people wanting to film her, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so it was pretty crazy last nine years of her life. Uh, so I ended up even having a heart attack because I was so stressed out about taking care of her. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, you know, I survived, and my mom learned some valuable lessons, and, uh, you know, she made her transition. So, <laughs> But it was a tough nine years. Um, a few weeks before she died, you know, she'd been saying, Kenneth, I want to die. Kenneth, don't make plans. I think I'm going to die on Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, Mom, that's called projection, right? <laughs> You're a psychiatrist. You should know this. So, uh, so eventually, a couple weeks before she died, she said, you know, Kenneth, I don't want to die. And I go, what? Oh, what did you say? And she goes, oh, you know, she started talking about food or something. And I'm like, oh, what, what were you talking about? And she refused to repeat it or acknowledge it. <clears throat> and so then she died a few weeks later. And for years, I was like, what did she mean by that? And I realized that she had learned her final lesson letting go of her anger, letting people take care of her instead of her taking care of, you know, all of society. And when she let go of that anger, it's what she taught. Like when you learn your lessons, you're allowed to graduate. And so apparently she learned her final lesson and she graduated. But it was amazing to see like, wow, <laughs> she really knew what she was talking about. That's exactly what she was teaching everyone. So, but unfortunately, you know, society didn't like that. She was going through her own stages. I mean, people were like angry at her for being angry at her situation. She's like, I'm a human being. Why can't I go through my own stages? <laughs> oh, my didn't like God. that. <laughs> so. There's so much to that story, Ken. First of all, it just, it just chokes me up so much that, I mean, she went through death threats and burning down her house and, I mean, killing her llama. I mean, that's just such horrid terrifying it like terrorizing her mm -hmm. and here's this woman who is loving help dying babies with aids i mean like what could be more innocent than that <laughs> so. and you know it's i i just i mean that just that hurts that's like a moral injury that hurts my heart and and i'm just truly sad that 
the last nine years of her life were so challenging. And I am so grateful to you for not getting your old life back. <laughs> and, and you are honoring her work and her legacy so beautifully, globally. And I probably won't sleep tonight figuring out how to help more. But anyways, um, so, so tell us how that became from that, from your mom's transition and letting go. That was 2004. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that led to you thinking that you were going to be moving on mm -hmm. and but, move on. <laughs> but um, a few, a few days after my mom died, uh, you know, my mother had people show up from around the world almost every day. I mean, it was incredible. My mother was on Oprah a couple of years before she died and my mom saying, oh, I sit in the chair like a zombie for 15 hours a day. I'm thinking, oh, mom, come on. Like, I know you're bored sometimes, but I mean, some days there was five, 10, 15 people waiting in a queue outside of her door to visit her. And, you know, there was royalty, there was movie stars, there was like, you know, Muhammad Ali, there was uh, llamas from Tibet. I mean, you know, oh. it was... You know, she said she was bored, but I mean, she was an overachiever. So her idea of boredom is like not mo most people's idea of boredom, right? <clears throat> yeah. So I understand, you know, while she was visiting with people, she also wanted to cook and garden and shop while writing a book, while doing this, while, you know, she was like an octopus, like constantly moving. So it did frustrate her. But um, yeah. So anyway, a few days after she died, a woman showed up from uh, Mumbai, India, and said, you know, they typically would call me to get permission to go see her. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. She just died. Yeah. She goes, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I've flown from India just to visit your mother for the afternoon. And I go, well, <clears throat> you know, I'm sympathetic. Oh, why don't you come to the room where she died? And you at least maybe get a sense of her presence from the room. Is her clothes are still there? Like, you know, ex exactly how she died. Her water bottle's still there. Her purse, everything is there. And so she just sat on my mom's bed for a few hours. We talked. I gave her some books. She listened to some audio tapes I had. She goes, you know what? I think I have enough inspiration just from being in this room to go back and start a hospice um, in respect to your mother and inspired by your mother. And it started me thinking, like, wow, like, is it, you know, she has such a presence even, you know, in death. Mm -hmm. I can really do something with this legacy. <clears throat> So I thought, oh, well, I'll start a foundation and they'll do all the work and I can get back to photography. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh -huh. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> started in 2005. And like some of the first people called me, these three women called me from Mexico and said, Ken, we've just read your mom's books. We're really inspired. Can we come see the foundation? I said, well, really, it's just my house. I, I'm working out of my garage. It's air conditioned, but it's just my garage. I mean, it looks nice, but they're like, we don't care. We just want to come. I'm like, okay, come. So these three women came, spent a long weekend with me, and they went back and started the first EKR Foundation. And I go, wow, well, this is really powerful stuff. Like, you know, first the woman from India, and then three women from Mexico. I have to really, like, grow this thing. <clears throat> so, you know, it took a couple of years. I had some challenges with some of the earlier boards. I didn't understand boards, and they didn't understand me. Um, but after a couple of years, we got into a rhythm. Um, I took a little break and somebody else took over and then she kind of burnt out and decided to go in a different direction a little bit, but, uh, I took over two and a half years ago. And since then, you know, I've kind of changed the direction once again of the foundation and I'm really focused on growing it. So we have groups now in 12 countries oh and we have eight more countries waiting to sign up for foundations in Lebanon, Israel, Portugal, Bolivia, Colombia, I mean, all over the world. And you know, it's really wow. inspiring to see this growth. After 15 years, it's yeah, <clears throat> it's just blossoming even more. Well, that is absolutely extraordinary. And what a tremendous way. It's like in memory of your mom and all of her beautiful work. And and it is just something that will change again, lives end of lives and and to, we need to have these conversations now a lot of people think that your mom the the book on death and dying she's written she wrote over 24 books was it uh technically i think she's written 
28-ish, but a, a couple of them we can't find, or they're only in foreign languages and they're a little obscure. But we say at least 24 books, and we just sold it in Mongolian Arabic for the first time. Oh, my God. So, so imagine On Death and Dying is in both Hebrew and Arabic. I mean, that really says something. It's That's a powerful message when it appeals to both cultures. Yes. You know, it's something that's psychological and talking about death appealing to both cultures is that's amazing. Amazing. Well, and, and the truth is because we all do want to die well. And and here's the thing, it's the elephant in the room we're gonna talk about. So many people, you know, there was controversy. Oh, these five stages that Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross said about grief, death, and dying. Everyone took those stages and they just ran with it. It's actually not exactly what your mom was just having conversations and put it in context so we could understand it. Well, you know, one of the most important things that we have to think about is that, you know, she was saying that grief is made up of different components. Yeah. Back in the 60s, that was radical thinking. So she's not saying that there's five. She's saying that grief is not one thing. It's a complex, right. you know, rainbow of emotions. So you know, you can't go back and we don't blame Thomas Edison because he didn't go far enough. I mean, she's the one who like, broke this open. So stop. yes, she wanted to be a part of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. And so that's what it did. And, you know, the book started, you know, bioethics. It changed bioethics in America. It changed the doctor-patient relationship. It started the hospice movement and the palliative care movement. It didn't invent those ideas, but it started the movement because it changed society so that we were in a place where we could talk about it. So we had other great people like Cicely Saunders and Florence Wald mm -hmm. building hospices, but without changing society, you can't do anything with a hospice unless society is willing to let it into their communities. Exactly. So, but, but I want to add that if you look in the book, and if you can see this, you know, yeah. we can clearly see that there's not five stages. No, I... Elizabeth talked about 13 stages. She talked about anxiety, preparatory grief, shock. You know, she talked about All letting go. Things. Yeah, yeah she so said we just these, are, these are like five major stages, but there's, and she talked, you know, and that was so you could remember it. That was like to the layman, but to professionals, you know, she talked about preparatory grief and partial denial and all these other things she thought are too complex for just somebody who's dying or a family to get their mind around, you know, as huge um, chart. She goes, let's just simplify it so people can remember it and get the idea that it's a complicated process. Thank you, Ken. I cannot thank you enough for the work you do. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Real Life Talks is about learning how to have great conversations about living well, grieving well, dying well, and everything in between. So, if you want to live well and die well, my call to action, as always, plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, bring your own tambourine to the party. <laughs> Bye for now.